Genesis chapter 24, please. And uh, open at the end of the chapter. I want you, if you have your Bible, to, to open and keep your Bibles open, please. At this the longest chapter in Genesis, we're only going to read a couple of verses uh, from it tonight. And when you find your place near the end of the chapter, let us bow in a moment's prayer, please. Let us quieten our hearts. And let us pray. Loving Father, we come before thee now for the most important part of this meeting. For the preaching of thy precious word. We bless thee, our God, tonight again for the privilege that we have to sound out the gospel of grace and love and mercy to men and women. And Father, I pray that thou will take me, thy servant, and touch these lips of clay, and fill me with the Holy Ghost and power, and that thy name will be glorified, exalted and uplifted, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, those of you who know Genesis chapter 24, it's an amazing chapter, a very romantic chapter, prophetical chapter, evangelical chapter, and on we could go. But the context here tonight in which we'll be preaching is that Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, who, by the way, is a type of the Holy Spirit. Eliezer has a day or so before our reading arrived at Haran in Mesopotamia in search of a wife for Abram's son Isaac. He had ten camels, a number of servants, and he was loaded with silver and gold and jewellery. The journey that he had came could have been seven to eight hundred miles across barren desert land. But whenever he arrived at the house of Rebekah, he was satisfied beyond all doubt that God had led him to the right place and to the right person and to the right one who would be the wife of Isaac. And he tells Rebecca and Rebecca's parents all about Abraham and all about Isaac. And he hands over the gifts and the jewelry to them. And we're reading at verse 54. Verse 54. We're picking up this great story here with a tremendous text for the close of this meeting this evening. Verse 54 of Genesis 24. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother, that is Rebecca's mother and brother, said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, and this is my text this evening, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse, and the Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, 
Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah arose, and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And as he came from the way of the well Lahora, for he dwelt in the south of the country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening tide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were come. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted or jumped off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And so reads the word of the Lord. There were three things that Rebecca had to face in relation to this soul-searching question, which is our text to close our meeting tonight in verse 58, when they said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now there are three things Rebecca had to face in relation to the answering of this question. And it is a question. And it is a question from God to your soul tonight because we're going to speak about another man. Three things faced this woman. And the three things where that you'll see in a moment. Three things that were going to change her life and destiny forever. Three things that would mean her forsaking her family, her culture, her home, her friends and her kindred, never to see them again. So it's a crossroads crisis. And if ever a woman stood at the crossroads, it is Rebecca. This question she had to face. She couldn't evade it because she had to answer yes or no. It demanded a yes or no answer. And except you're a politician tonight, you could all answer that. Because it, it seems to me that they don't know the difference in yes and no. But anybody with any sense tonight will know what yes and what no means. And so that was the question she had to face. Yes or no. Oh, the pull that must have went on in this dear woman's soul, this beautiful girl, this clean, courteous, industrious girl that we read about in Genesis here. She had to make a choice. And my friend, you're going to have to make a choice tonight about your future, a choice that will change forever your destiny in this meeting this evening. I'm going to bring you face to face tonight, as Stephen and Johnny has been doing on other nights, with a greater than Isaac, because there's a greater than Isaac here. And you that are not saved tonight in this meeting, you must answer yes or no to Christ. You must say tonight, I will go or I will not go with him. You must say, I will take Christ tonight or I will not have him to rule over me. 
Praise God as we read this chapter and as we read the scriptures that God the Father is still sending and the Spirit is still searching out a bride for his Son. He says, I will build my church. And the Holy Spirit tonight is going to, going to speak and is speaking to some one or ones in this meeting. This is your night. He has come for you tonight. He has come to save you tonight. He has come to change your life tonight. And you have got to say yes or no. None of this hyper-Calvinistic business that she had to be forced. No, no forcing at it. No forcing whatsoever. She had the choice to make that whosoever will may come. And you're going to have to make this choice tonight in relation to Jesus Christ. I love that wee verse in the Song of Solomon where, where it says, he says to the spouse, Rise up, my loved one, and come away, for the winter is past and the rain is gone. And he is saying to some of you tonight, rise up. It's time for you to rise up, and it's time for you to come away out of the winter, out of the death, out of the darkness, out of the sin, and come to Christ and have eternal life. Now as Rebecca stood at this crossroads, the first thing that she had to face was this. She had to be convinced beyond all doubt that Isaac existed. She had to be convinced in her mind that Isaac existed. How did she know such a person existed? She had never seen him. She had never heard him. She had never even heard of the country or the land that he lived in. And this man that has come, Eliezer, he's just there a day or two. He's a stranger. Why should she believe in him? Believe him? Now, I'm speaking to those of you who are not saved tonight. I want you to think of this. I'm speaking to you tonight that know not Christ as your Savior. And you might well say to me and Johnny and Stephen, you're asking us to leave our friends, to leave our companions, to forsake all and follow a man that we have never seen. We have never heard ourselves. Sure, that's only hearsay. How do we know that Christ exists? How do we know that there is a God? How do we know that there is a heaven? And people say to me and have said to me often, I, I have never heard of anybody coming back from the dead. Nobody has ever come back and told me that there's a heaven or told me that there's a hell. Well, let me have news for you tonight. Nobody will be coming back. God, the Lord, Jesus Christ, himself sent the Holy Spirit to us. The Holy Spirit is searching. The Holy Spirit is seeking. The Holy Spirit is revealing. We, the servants of God, are telling you tonight that there is a Savior, there is a Lord, there is a God, there's heaven and there's home. We're telling you that's the word that we're bringing, the word of God to you. And by faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's by faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And as you sit there tonight, don't be looking for signs. Don't be looking for feelings because it's by faith. The Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is striving. The Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is convincing men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he's speaking to you, and well, you know it. We can make all the excuses that we like. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And we're telling tonight that he exists. And he's richer than Isaac. And he's greater than Isaac. And he's more powerful than Isaac. And he's more mighty than Isaac. And we could go on and on the whole night. Wilt thou not go with this man? By faith, whom having not seen, we love. Man, when that old uncle and at 11 o'clock on the Monday morning and Fermanagh started to I go down on his knees and started to talk to me about my soul. I didn't know what he was talking about. 
I'd never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I had never heard him speaking to me. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about God. And I didn't want to know anything about God. But this old servant of God told me. He told me about a Savior. He told me that there was one who died for me. There was one who loved me. There was one who gave himself for me. And by faith I grasped it. If, he's, if what this man's saying is true, if there's something better in life than that, you know why that was? Because the Holy Spirit was striving, was working, was showing, and the Holy Spirit's office is to point men and women to Christ. And he's pointing you to the Savior. Even this evening, my dear friend, you can make all the excuses that you want. It's my job to tell you like Isaac told this woman and her family, and it's your job to believe it. You've got to believe it tonight. Faith cometh again, I say, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is the word of God. This is what God says. And I don't know everything that the servant told Rebecca, but you know on that long journey, maybe five or six weeks or two months or more, home I say he told her a lot of things about Isaac and I was wondering today did he tell her did he tell Rebecca about Mount Moriah I wonder did he tell Rebecca that that the man that she was going to meet was laid on an altar on Mount Moriah and he was strapped there and, and, and there he, he, he lay as a sacrifice and his father lifted the knife to plunge it into it. I wonder, did she tell him about that incident at Moriah? But my friend, I don't know whether she did or not, but I'm going to tell you tonight about a greater sacrifice. I'm going to tell you about one tonight who on that old cross uh, hung naked for her sins, stripped and spat upon and crowned with thorns, bore my sins on his own body on the tree. I heard that. I heard that Christ died. I heard that he rose again. I heard that he suffered an awful death. And by faith I trusted in him. And by faith I come. And by faith he saved me. And you'll have to come the same way. You've got to answer this question. Will you go with him or will you not go with him? Justified by faith through his blood, we have peace with God. Oh, I say to you again, don't be waiting on feelings. Don't be waiting on a sign from heaven. Don't be waiting on some spectacular phenomena. Ah, just by simple faith, trust Christ tonight. Just believe what I'm saying tonight, that there's a Savior, that he died, that he rose again, that he's almighty and he's all-powerful and he's coming again and he wants to save you and he has come to seek for you and he has come a longer distance than this man came. He come from the glory. He came from the heaven's glory down into this old sinful world and he's calling you out of thousands tonight. He's saying, come, for all things are now ready. But not only had she to settle and deal with the fact that Isaac existed, she had to deal with the fact that her family resisted. Oh, we read. Her brother and her mother stepped out and faced Eliezer and said, let her stay another ten days at least. And like a flash, now listen, like a flash, Eliezer came back and he said, hinder me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. What is he saying? He is saying, this is God's timing. I'm in the way that the Lord led me, he said earlier on. This is the moment for Rebecca. This is the day that God has Destined for Rebecca to be called out from amongst them and to come to Isaac. And my friend, it's the same for you tonight. Here's what he said. Hinder me not. Hinder me not. Listen, don't hinder the Holy Spirit tonight. Don't dig in your heels tonight and say, I'm not going. This foolish man and foolish woman the, the brother and the wife of, uh, 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 the brother and the mother of Rebecca, let her stay another 10 days. 
My friend, I couldn't give you 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Oh, a lot can happen in 10 days. Let her stay another 10 days. But Eliza says, I'm not staying. I'm going. And I'm going back. And if she doesn't come, Isaac's not going to come for her. That's in the beginning of the chapter. So this is a crucial moment. This is a crisis moment. This now, she has to make the decision now, at this moment, as she stands there, that day, this is her day. Dear, it's your day tonight. Sir, don't fool about with God. Don't hinder the Holy Ghost. Don't remonstrate or rebuke him any more. Say, like Rebecca, I will go with this man. Procrastination is not only the thief of time, it's the thief of our souls. Do you know that hell's populated tonight with those who postponed and put off the moment that God spoke to them. Sometimes in mercy, sometimes in grace, sometimes in love. He speaks once and twice and three times and four times. And you know what I'm talking about tonight. Oh, how gracious he is. But tonight, hinder not the Holy Spirit. When the devil can't stop the preaching of the gospel and the striving of the Holy Spirit and the convicting of sin, his last weapon is to delay the soul. Delay the soul. Not tonight, tomorrow. More than that's going through your mind now. Not tonight, tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 days, 20 days. My friend, I say again, you haven't 10 seconds. All the devil wants you to do tonight is say, that man's right. The devil doesn't mind you saying that. And I believe the gospel and he doesn't mind you saying that. And I believe he's preaching truth and he doesn't mind you saying that. He doesn't mind very many things as long as he can stop you from trusting him by faith and reaching out and saying, I will go tonight. If he can get you out, get you home to the news. Get you home to the television. Get you home to the family. Get you home to the problems. Get you home to Monday morning as all is chores. And then as the week goes on, the, the voice will grow faint and fainter. The family resisted. I say to you tonight, don't let your mother don't let your brother, don't let your wife or your husband or your sister or your friend delay you. Don't listen to them when they say that you have time. Don't listen to them when you say another 10 days. No, behold now, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Many years ago, I heard a story, a true story, about a man, a farmer, in the county of Antrim. He was a bachelor. He had 150 acres of good land. But he hated God. And the Faith Mission pilgrims had a mission hall not far from where he was, and they visited him and he chased them every time and cursed the God of Abram and Isaac and of Jacob. But he had a nephew whom he had told that he was going to, that he had made his will and that he was going to give him the farm and the money and he had plenty of money and boys are fond of money. And this nephew started to go to the faith mission meetings. And the old rascal got to hear it. 
And he called them one day and he, up one day and he said to them, you're going to these meetings? That's right. He says, if you go another night, he says, I'm going to change my will and you'll not get one rood or one hoof from this place. I wonder what some of you would do. Hmm? And God was dealing with a young man and that was obvious because of what he said afterwards. And to please the old boy, he didn't go back. And God dealt with him, but he wouldn't go back. And he got the farm and he got the money. And a number of years after, he was heard to say, Oh, it was the worst choice in my life. Oh, if only I had that to live again. Oh, if only I could be back to those meetings. If only I could be back. I tell you what followed that fella was nothing but sorrow and darkness and death and hell to the very end. A young fella said to me one day in the county of Manor about 20 years ago, I says, how did you get saved? Well, he says, it's not far from our brother doing the meeting. Robert's going to do the meetings down in Coonan starting next Sunday night. Not far from there. The brethren had a mission. And it went on for 16 weeks. And this fellow that I'm talking to now went every night. And his mother said to him, you needn't be going back near them meetings. But he says, I'm going. And he went. And he got saved the last night. Now I'm talking tonight about being hindered. His mother did everything she could to stop him. And he got saved. And he came home. And he told the mother, I talked to him. I heard his testimony. And he would... Come in at night, he started to go to other churches and other meetings and started to go on with the Lord. And he used to come home at night. Before he got saved, he was a drunkard. He, he was drinking and fighting around for manna. And he used to come home from the meetings at night and pull back the clothes in his mother's house in the bed and she had beer bottles in under the clothes. My mother, you don't hinder your child. If you're not saved yourself, if you're damned yourself, don't be damning them. You hear that? If you're going to go to hell, don't be taking your children with you to hell. You hear that, Father? If you're duking about an old pub and doing the lottery, and lying and fooling about. Your children will do the same probably. And hell will be awful for you if you let your children go to hell. Go yourself if you want to. Hinder me not. Hinder me not. I'm going now. I'm going back to my father Abram. I'm going back to Isaac. Isaac is not coming here. I'm going back. She can stay. If she doesn't come, she has a choice to make. She makes it now. She says yes or she says no or else she stays. Come on, you read it when you go home and tell me anything else. She had to face the existing of Isaac. Did he exist? Well, I tell you this, she's not a fool. This beautiful Rebecca was no fool. She's not going to follow a man that she'd never seen till a man that she'd never seen for weeks and weeks over a barren desert mountain. Dangerous, evil, wicked place. She's not going to go unless she's convinced in her heart. Are you convinced tonight? That you're going to hell. Are you convinced tonight that there's a saviour? And he has his arms outstretched. And he's doing all he can. 
for you to come at old false profession you made years ago, there's nothing in it. No more than there's in that. For you're going nowhere with God, and you know it. Oh, you made a wee profession when you were a child or a teenager. You said, oh, Lord, will you come into my heart? And someone come out and said you were saved. Well, not a bit. Do you love the Lord tonight? Boy, you need to be in the light boat this morning to hear, Stephen, the joy of the Lord that's in, in our hearts because we love the Lord because of what he has done for his grace and his mercy. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so excited tonight that he came away down into Fermanagh and he sought me and he chose me and he called me and he said to me, come, and I'm glad I say, I'll go. The greatest thing I ever said in my life was, I will go. Hinder me not. Grieve not. Quench not. The Holy Spirit, my spirit, shall not always strive with man. He has come for you tonight. I don't know who. Some of he's come. He's come for you tonight. You. You. We see the existing of Isaac, the resisting of the family, and the insisting of Ruth. I will go. No conditions attached. No ifs or buts or nothing else. I will go. I'll forsake my family. I'll forsake my home. I'll forsake my future, whatever it is. I'll forsake my way of life. I will step out by faith. And I'll step out into the unknown. She didn't know much about Isaac. And I tell you, listen, the morning that I got saved down there in Vermana, I knew nothing. I just believed in my heart that what this old uncle, because that's what I said. I said, Lord, if what this man saying is true, if there is a saviour, if there's someone to give me a better life than this, to take away my sin and give me peace with God and assurance or something, like that, I said, would you do it? Would you do it now? I didn't know anything about it. But you know, whenever I started on the journey, whenever Rebecca started on this journey with this servant, I tell you, she trusted the servant. She trusted, she trusted him to protect her, to preserve her all those weeks and months maybe that she traveled through this barren terrain. She trusted him. Listen, I trust him tonight. And as I've gone down the road with him over the years and I'm heading towards the sea, I'm going to see him one day. I'm going to see him as, I, as Rebecca saw Isaac. I'm going to see him who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm going to clap my eyes on him one day. Glory to God. And as I'm journeying down the road, this last 45 years, I've been learning of him. I've been hearing from him. I've been speaking to him. I'm getting closer to him. Glory to God. Do you know anything about this tonight? The road may be barren and the road may be dangerous. An old believer tonight on the road is troublesome, isn't it? Full of trials and sickness and death and sin. Ah, but we're getting closer. Hallelujah. We're getting near. There's been many a dark mountain. There's been many a barren day. But we're getting closer and we're learning more. And the closer we get, and the more we love him. Ah, I love him more today than I ever loved him before. He chose me. He called me. He saved me. Until the day I see his face, and I sit at his feet. As she went into that tent, and loved Isaac. Oh, I'm going to sit at a seat for all eternity. Oh, what a love story. Are you going to come to us? Oh, well, I don't know very much. You don't need to know very much. You know you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. You know Christ died for you. Mm -hmm. You know that he can save you if you'll call. 
Do you believe that he has come for you tonight? And he's facing you tonight and you're standing just where Rebecca stood. And the question is this, wilt thou go with this man? And you're going to have to make that, you know, you'll make it. When you go through that door, you turn right towards your car or you turn left towards this portico. Now, you don't have to do that. You can make it where you sit. But I would fear if the devil gets you out of this field tonight. Oh, I'll take time till I go home. No. No preacher in his right senses could tell you to go home and get right with God. How do I know you'll get home? No right preacher could say to you, come back tomorrow night and trust Christ. I would never say it and never did in my life. I've saw too much. No oh, believer tonight, keep going. A greater than Isaac is waiting. Oh, backslider tonight, you've missed out. You've stopped somewhere along the mountain track and you're away out in the mountains, wild and bare. You've let the Holy Spirit go on. You've, got, you've let the servant go on and you're, you're wandering about in, in, in the old wilderness of sin and darkness. I say to you, get on the road again. And Isaac was meditating in the field and he lifted up his eyes and he said, the camels are coming. <laughs> Man, he was watching. <laughs> I tell you, it's not the camels that's coming, the church is coming. We're going to come to meet him some of these days. Will you come to him tonight? You know he exists, don't you? You've heard it from a child. You've been taught it all your life. That Jesus Christ is alive and he can save you. And those that are resisting him, whoever's hindering you tonight, shake it off. Let it be your mother or your brother. Just dig in your heels and say, I will go with this man. We're going to sing in closing. A hymn that I sometimes I sometimes can't sing. I can't sing anyway, as most of you know that, but this is a very emotional hymn to me. I'm just looking for the number of it here. Face to face with Christ my Savior. If anybody gets it before me. Sorry? 593. One Sunday night. One Sunday night. 40 years ago. In a gospel meeting in church place in Lurgan in the old bus man's mission just opposite the barrier one of the barriers that was guarded to protect the town of Lurgan one Sunday night the Christian Police Association conducted a meeting in that Mission Hall. And the big fella, he was six foot two, a man whom I loved and whom I served with. He was away down, away from the deep south of Ireland. And he was as straight as a rush. Saved by God's grace under the preaching of Willie Mull. And he was leading the meeting in the mission hall that night while policemen testified and sung and preached. And he closed with this hymn, Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face 
what will it be? And they tell me now I wasn't there. They tell me that that the presence and the sense of God as the sound was mighty. He was on early turn the next morning. And about before nine o'clock, he left the police station. And he walked down to the barrier beside the mission hall. To speak to the men that were man in the bar. And a wicked, evil, fiendish gunman ran out from the entry at the side of the wee mission hall and cut him to pieces. And big Harry Cobb lay dying on the street of Lourdes. And I was at his funeral. Little did he know, or did he know? Did he know? For he hadn't long to wait. Face to face with Christ, my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. 